What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Barrett. Alongside me, Tori McElhaney and Chris Rim, as we break down a 30-20 to loss. The Atlanta Falcons lost 30-20 to to the rival New Orleans Saints on Sunday in Week 18 at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Not a desired outcome, not a way that the Falcons wanted to wrap their 2021 campaign and guys, let's be honest, we're not going to talk a whole lot about the details of, of this game. I think this fan base has kind of really moved on and they want to talk about the offseason and they want to talk about what comes next. And there are a lot of interesting things to discuss. So we're going to jump into all of those things over the course of four quarters. You guys know the format by now. It's five minutes on each topic. We're going to uh, debate vigorously uh, four different things, starting with Matt Ryan and all the chatter around him and his future into 2022. Uh, Also some other key Falcons free agents who are going to hit the open market this spring. We are going to talk about what needs have emerged by all three of us watching this 2021 campaign. And uh, of course, we're going to take a look at now that we know where the Falcons draft at number eight overall, we're going to look at what they should do with that pick, a topic that we'll probably discuss a couple thousand times before they actually make it. Um, so before we jump into all that forward thinking talk, uh, Tori and Chris, let's, Tori, let's start with you first. What is your big takeaway from the regular season finale as a four quarter game? Well, I think honestly, it, to me, it was kind of, I, I was already looking ahead even as this game was going on. I think once we saw how this game was going in that first half and it wasn't looking good, I immediately kind of put on blinders to looking straight to the 2022 offseason. And what I spent a lot of time thinking about post game was the needs that I think we saw very evidently be needs in this game. And I'm talking a lack of pass rush. I'm talking about some issues on the offensive line. I'm talking about maybe running backs and receivers. I mean, these are all things that I think the Saints really took advantage of that the Falcons really don't have full strength in those areas. And so to me, it kind of correlated, my takeaway from this game kind of correlated to what I think going, what I'm thinking kind of going into the 2022 off season. Well then Chris, maybe I won't, I won't try to pigeonhole you as much. What was going through your mind over the course of this game and in its aftermath? Yeah, I think it was a lot of what what Tori said, but I guess not to reiterate the entire same thing she said. I would I would say what stood out to me from the the, the game itself was the turnovers. They Tori talked about it. They they had three two in a row, and then they had three turnovers on the the first play of a drive, uh, an interception, and then um, fumbles, and and then the time of possession um, was so. I think it was a twenty minute gap. I think it was thirty five minutes, almost thirty five minutes for the Saints, and a little over 15 for the, for the Falcons. So when you have that kind of gap, it's tough for your def- any defense, the best defense is to, to play well. And, I, and, I, and the defense did uh, better in, in the second half, but the first half, it was, it was a challenge. But that's what stood out to me from the game. Yeah, I, I think that both of you guys are, are dead on in the fact that this game showed the reasons why the Falcons weren't competitive enough, especially uh, against top teams that they fell into trouble when they lost the uh, turnover battle, when they weren't good on run defense and when they fell behind early. Um, And I think that all those things are key. Now we've talked about this saints game right now. It's going to be about what happens next and what's moving forward. But before we get to all that, We have to give another big thank you to our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons. The the all-new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love, like the Falcons' final whistle podcast. Learn all about the awesome new features of Windows 11 at windows.com. We are starting quarter number one, talking about QB number one. That's Matt Ryan, who shortly after wrapping his 14th season as Falcons starting quarterback, he was asked about his 15th season or the prospects of his 15th season, whether he's going to be back next year, uh, despite the fact that he obviously has a huge uh, salary cap number, a lot of dead money associated with it. And uh, Arthur Smith was asked about it. Matt Ryan was asked about it. Tori, you were in that press conference. Kind of give us the tone and the vibe and what was said during those exchanges. Yeah, so I will say this. Arthur Smith was a lot more heated 
than Matt Ryan was about the future of Matt Ryan, which I thought is funny. When you're talking about the future of one guy, you think the guy in question would probably be a little bit more heated about his own future. But it was Arthur Smith, and he very much was adamant that rumors are rumors. And he he basically said that he wasn't going to get into Matt Ryan's future, that Matt knew what the Falcons thought of him, and they know what, like, the, like Matt thinks of the Falcons and he was very, very adamant that he was not going to get into it. And then about 15, 20 minutes later, when Matt was asked about it, Matt was just like, kind of like, yeah, you know, I'd love to be back. I love it here. I, I've always want to be here. And I essentially think that we're laying a good foundation here and I like what we're building. And, and so I, I think it's really funny if we're just talking about like the atmosphere of these press conferences, mm. Arthur Smith and Matt Ryan's were very different in how kind of they handled the questions of Matt Ryan's future with the Falcons. And I think how the Atlanta Falcons handle Matt Ryan's future. What a segue. Uh, how, how, how the Falcons handle Matt Ryan's future, um, whether he's going to be around next year, uh, I think is going to be a fascinating portion of this offseason. I just spent 900 words explaining why he's the right guy for the Falcons in 2022. That includes the benefit of the 2022 product is using all of your available assets to build up the team around Matt Ryan and the team around his inevitable successor, right? It frees up some options. You don't have to take a quarterback. You can, if you want to, but you don't have to. And um, I think that there are a bunch of benefits going into it. Um, so I do think that he should come back next year. Matt Ryan, as you said, Tori was very clear that he wanted to come back here we're not talking a lot about the finances here right um you've been asked about this on every radio show and podcast known to mankind finances <laughs> play uh, a, a role here too don't they no you're uh, you're absolutely right and that is a question that i get asked all the time and i basically say the every single time i don't see how you get rid of matt ryan because of his cap hit in 2022 and 2023 his contract has been restructured so many times and essentially it's just kicking money down the road at some point you're gonna have to pay matt ryan the money he's owed and we have reached that point because there's only two years left on this contract there is no more time to kick the can down the road anymore so when people ask me about matt ryan coming back i'm just like well find me a way that it makes sense to get rid of him because as of right now i don't see how it makes sense and i i don't know how to crunch the numbers in that way to where to where you <laughs> part ways with matt ryan and you're not in one of the biggest holes you'll i've ever seen an organization be in i just don't know how that correlates now chris let's so we we, we just talked about money now let's take it all away you you saw every single snap that matt ryan took for the Atlanta Falcons this season. You know what he was working with. What were your impressions of this season? And uh, um, I hate to even ask it this way, but I will it anyway. Uh, you know, do you think that he still got it at this point in his career? Yeah, yeah, I think he, I think he, he still has it. I think, uh, you know, this season was a lot in terms of the uh, losing, losing, well, losing Julio and then losing Calvin and then, I'm trying to build a relationship with Kyle and him kind of becoming that number one option. And then Russ being out, um, Hayden being out, you know, I think Lee Smith caught nine passes this year. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it, there was a lot. It's hard for, I think it, it, it would be hard for a lot of quarterbacks and not to mention that there were some struggles with, with the offensive line um, throughout the year. Um, so I think, yeah, I think for Matt, I think Matt, um, his I, like like I've, my whole process thought process with Matt has been in order for him to be successful with his style of play. Um, I just think the pieces also need to be around him in order for him to be successful. It doesn't mean that he needs a, you know, I think Lee Smith calls him Lamborghini. He doesn't need a bunch of Lamborghinis at wide receiver. <laughs> I, think, I think he needs some. I think he needs some Lamborghinis up front, and that's not saying he doesn't have you know a couple in in Lindstrom and and Jake Matthews, but that's just saying that you know some some support would be helpful. Um, and I think if they continue to build that line, I think you'll continue to see um, increased performance from him in the offense. Yeah, and I, I think any time that you're- Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. Do we for. consider offensive linemen Lamborghinis? Because I always think they're like Ford trucks. Like yeah, I but they're, yeah, they're more- they're yeah, like they're, they're, yeah, yeah, for sure. They're more like 
F one fifties for sure. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. I would definitely say that like that like Chris Lindstrom is that like raised F one fifty with like all the chrome grill and everything like yeah. completely tricked out. That's Chris Lindstrom. <laughs> I think what Chris was saying is we need more tricked out trucks. Up <laughs> there you go. Right? Yeah. Lamborghinis sure. on the outside, tricked up yeah. trucks up front and I, I think we're gonna this won't be the last time that we're gonna talk about this when you deal with a quarterback with as much success as matt ryan who's meant him as much to this franchise who is let's be honest closer to the end of his tenure here um than in than at any other point and there is some uncertainty it's going to fuel speculation that the fan base is divided and we will continue to bring rationality to this topic i promise you that we are kicking off quarter number two, talking about uh, some guys who are heading towards the open market this spring. Guys who are heading who are headed towards unrestricted free agency, and the Falcons have quite a few in the twenties, actually. And of that group, there are some guys that you can see them just kind of automatically, you know, parting ways uh, with them. There are some key guys that that Chris Rim you talked to after Sunday's game. Guys like Russell Gage. Guys like Hayden Hurst. Guys like Foye Aluokan, guys who could have something of a market or uh, whether they're coming back or not. Chris, what did those guys uh, have to say? What, what, what stood out uh, to you from their postgame press conferences regarding their futures? Yeah, I think it was kind of all it was kind of all pretty uniform in terms of what well, I think with Foye and, and, and Russ, they were definitely of the of the mindset of, you know, the, well, I think Russ was the most out of the three who said, you know, I want to be here. Russ said explicitly, you know, Atlanta has first priority, but Russ also said he doesn't really know anything about free agency. Like growing up when he played Madden, he always simmed that part of the season because he hated <laughs> and he didn't, he lost all the players and stuff. So he doesn't, know, he doesn't know anything about free agency. At least that's what he's telling us. Um, and then Foyer, as he says, he said, you know, he's been, maybe outside of AJ Terrell, maybe the best player on, on the defense. So he, he, I think he understands that, that he might have a, a, a lot of teams, a lot of suitors who, who are interested in him. And what he said though, was that he's not really looking for the, the highest paying team or the whoever's going to offer him the most money. It's more about where he can have continued success and continued growth. And he's also said before he doesn't, you know, changing might not always help that being in the same system and learning he, he wonders how, how much better he can grow in a system like this. And for Hayden, um, it was just about opportunity. And I think this, this season for him has been ups and downs because, you know, his, his option wasn't picked up uh, in the preseason. And then as, as, um, as he mentioned post game today, when he, when he realized that he knew he would need to have a, a good year. Um, and he, and he admitted post game that it hasn't been the year that he had hoped. And some of that has has been because of injury, and then he was put on the you know reserve COVID list for a couple of games, so he's missed four games because of that. And there's been a lot of changes, so for him, it's all about opportunity and chances to play, whether that's in Atlanta or not. Yeah, I mean, th- there's going to be a lot of roster turnover uh, with with a lot of these different free agents. It's it's interesting to to hear guys who have been around here for a while that you think about like Russell Gage coming up from the bottom and Foyer coming up from the bottom and whether they're going to have a market to go out there and, and cash in on all the hard work that they've done. Um, Tori, I don't know if you, if we're just talking about these three, and I know that doesn't include Patterson and uh, a lot of other guys that are, uh, that are going to hit the market. If you're going, if you're coming up with, with, uh, with one of these three and you got limited funds and you're playing GM for the moment, who do you jump after and why? Oh gosh, put me on the spot. I That's mean, I, I think if I'm just talking about, I know, I think if I'm just talking about these three, I mean, I've written so many stories about Foyer. I feel like people are tired of me talking about him, but I, I probably would say Foyer because I, I don't know. And I, I think about it this way. He's the number one tackler in the league right now. And a lot of people are very skeptical about that number because they're like, well, that means that he's, like the the ball's getting to him the guy is getting to him he has to make that tackle because the defensive line is so bad and I'm like yeah that that's probably all well and true like but think about it if he wasn't there think about it if he didn't have those 192 tackles where the Falcons defense would be if he wasn't out there and I 
I think another thing, another part of his game is that like he's this Mike linebacker that is very, very important to Dean P's scheme and just being the guy to make the call across the defense. And the fact that you have somebody that Dean very much trusts in foyer able to do that and take on that role and, and to do it well and be productive in that role to not have to have someone else come in and relearn the scheme and how Dean wants it and how he wants the calls coming in and everything like that. I mean, I think that goes a long way too. So for me, I, I'm saying like, pull what money you need to, to, to resign Foyer and keep him here. I really think it's going to be fascinating because everybody who's listening to this podcast knows that the Falcons don't have mountains of salary cap space available. They can't just like toss hundreds at people everywhere that they go. Terry's not just slapping it around necessarily. He just doesn't have that yet. Uh, so I think it'll be interesting to see uh, how they do with the funds that they have and how they prioritize guys. I, I If we're just talking, do you want Foyer back? Yeah, you do. Do you want one of the best uh, third down targets in the NFL back? Of course you do. Do you want a complimentary tight end? Um, of course you do, but it's just a matter of what you can afford, what the market is. There are so many factors here that I, I think it's going to be fascinating, um, especially for, for like football nerds like us, right? Because if you look at teams with tons of cap space and they go sign A-list free agents, okay? And that's exciting on the first day of free agency, but how can the Falcons maximize the funds that they do have to get the upgrades that are required? Um, I think all those things are gonna be interesting as they move forward. And we eventually see if this was the last game in a Falcons uniform for Russ, for Foyer, for Hayden, for uh, a number of popular guys who have been representing Atlanta well in recent seasons. Going down to quarter number three, talking about what the Falcons need, where they need to upgrade the most. Now, there's a lot of holes, probably more than they can address over the course of one offseason, considering the, their, their salary cap constraints that we have been talking about. Tori, you wrote a, a, a priority list, a checklist as it stands right now as we enter the offseason. Uh, what was your number one? What kind of went into your thinking uh, when it came to making that list? Two words. Pass rush. Okay. I, cannot, I cannot stress this enough that the Falcons have to develop a pass rush and they have to do it in multiple ways. I believe they have to do it through the draft and through free agency. I think this is going to be a complete overhaul. I think it needs to be a complete overhaul because, and it, you know, we can look at numbers all day long, but the fact of the matter is the reality is the Falcons had the worst pass rush in the NFL in 2021 period. There were, individuals with more sacks than the entire Falcons defense had. That is unacceptable. Even Dean Pease was talking about it this week when he was like, we have to develop a pass rush. We just straight up need more. And he was asked, how do you do that? And he was like, well, it can be through experience, but it can also be through getting guys who have this God given talent to go out there and rush the passer without, you know, a blitz being called or anything or, or applying a certain pressure. I mean, they just can go out and beat their guy. That's what the Falcons need. So in terms of priorities, there will be nothing. And I do, I'm very passionate about this. There will be nothing tell. that I will put ahead of pass rush this off season. They have got to get a pass rush and I will die on this hill. All right, I'm done. The Falcons played, I know sacks aren't a be all end all, right? But, 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 dot, dot, dot. The Falcons played 17 games this year. They had 17 sacks. Uh, what? That, that does not compute to me. So, Chris Rim, if, if pass rush was number one on your priority list, if you were making one, uh, if it is, what's your number two? If it wasn't, what's your number one? Uh, no, I would say pass rush would be the number one. And I think also, like Tori said, Dean said that this week that they need that. I also think if there's a pass rush or or even a, another guy next to Grady, yeah. I think Grady looks a lot different. <laughs> and Grady looks and, – and Grady's numbers look a lot different. Um, you know, this year his numbers didn't look as good as they have because, uh, because of that. Um, so – because they could just focus on him. But I would say on the other side, just those – those trucks, those Ford F-150s, those, <laughs> those, those trucks, man, you know, um, when you look, I thought, 
I think the the game went, the game against the Tampa Bay earlier this year, the first time the Falcons played Tampa Bay, I was just shocked to see how Brady could just stand back there and, you know, kind of – not just against the Falcons, but against any team, if you, if you watch. He can kind of stand back there and, you know, do what he wants to do for a couple seconds. And uh, not, not a shot to the offensive line, but – Matt Ryan can't always do that. And I think his, his game is suited to where obviously he doesn't need all day, but he needs a second to go through a couple of progressions. And oftentimes you, Ryan, Matt is running frantically You've seen Matt run. I don't know. I don't know what his rushing yards are this season, but I don't, they, they might be a little high, but I, I don't know. We've seen him run. We've seen him taunt people in the end zone, him diving in the end zone. <laughs> um, Matt has been running more than, than I, I, I guess I remember watching the Falcons, but I, I really think that this team would benefit on both sides in the trenches from just improving their offensive line and defensive line. So I think those are the the, the two things that they need to upgrade down there. Some more F one fifties like Scott <laughs> picked out. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just crazy. You talk about all that and they're probably going to need some Lamborghinis too. Right. Because there's, we don't know. The one thing that we know is that we don't know what's what Calvin Ridley's future holds, right. Could be here. Could not be here. We don't know. Russ Gage could find a great market for himself. He could be gone and they, and Cordero Patterson could be gone and they, and they could have to refit their, their skill positions as well. So I, I think there's, but Hold nobody on, can dispute, it. nobody can dispute the, the, that Tory's right. Right. And I, will add this, I will add this about the wide receivers. If they went all out today and allowed everybody who's a free agent in 2022 to walk, the only people who would be in the wide receiver room would be Calvin Ridley and Frank Darby. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everybody else is a, is a free agent in 2022. And we don't even know kind of what the deal is going to be with Calvin either. Right. So there's, there, uh, there's a lot to work on. Uh, there are a lot of needs. And uh, I think that uh, Terry Fontenot and Kyle Smith and the entire front office um, that, that there's a lot of different ways that they can upgrade this roster. Uh, they got to hit right in free agency. And of course the NFL draft, which we're getting to coming up next. In the fourth quarter, we are looking all the way towards beyond free agency, towards late April and early May, when the Falcons go on the clock at, we know the number now, number eight overall. The loss to the Saints uh, pushed them well into the top 10. Their uh, strength of schedule um, gave them a higher pick than others that finished at seven and 10. So they are at number eight. That gives them a lot of options with what to do with number eight. You all are going to talk about this at bars around your basement pub table uh, over the course of the next four months. It's going to be fascinating to see where they go with this. It's pretty clear that uh, there are some needs, right? Pass rush, uh, Tori, you're, you're, you're right. I think even with everything else that is an issue that, that has holes that, that need to be filled, pass rush is right there. I, during the college football season, I watched Georgia because I'm on the bandwagon and I watch yeah. UCLA because that's where I went to school. So don't ask me about the draft until the senior bowl. Okay. I need some time to do some research. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, number eight, they're going to have an opportunity to nail a big time player at wide receiver, edge rusher tackle. Those are all premium positions. Those are all positions worthy of, of really, you know, uh, getting after it, having that number eight pick Tori, uh, do you think that there's a golden opportunity there to, to a nail a, a big time player? 100%, and I think they have to, um, especially if they go edge rusher early. I think back, and I, you know, covering this this team, I don't know if there's been a really solid edge rusher that they've drafted in those early rounds in a long, long time. I may be wrong, but just off the top of my head. So if they go, I mean, and then also, I think about it too, if they go offensive line and they go grab a tackle, or a guard, uh, they got to hit on that too. You have three first rounders on the offensive line right now in Jake Matthews, Chris Lindstrom, and Caleb McGarry. And I would say two of the three have panned out for you. And I, I think you have, whatever direction you go, you just have to hit on this first round pick. It can't be a pick that doesn't pan out. I know that's putting a lot of pressure, 
on this organization and the people making the decisions, but I think they're putting just as much pressure on themselves. I just think back to uh, some decisions and some first round picks that in maybe the past 10 years didn't work out for the Falcons and how I feel like we're still feeling the ramifications of those picks not working out even today. Um, so I, I, that pick is so, so very important. And I think you've got to get someone who can come in and be a difference maker immediately. Like that's what we saw Kyle Pitts be in 2021. We saw him come in and be a difference maker immediately, a record breaker immediately. That's what the Falcons have to strive to find again in 2022. Yeah. And uh, you brought up a great point there when it, it, uh, it must be, it's difficult when, uh, when you invest a first round pick in somebody that, that doesn't pan out, we know that panning out is, I don't know, 50% or something like that. But, but, but you look at it had to have to reinvest in offensive tackle after you did that two years ago is difficult. You talk about yeah. um, that they invested in edge rushers in 2015 with Vic Beasley, Vic Beasley, 2017 with Tack McKinley. Those did not work out as they would have liked. Um, 2017 for, for TAC, that's right. He'd still be in his prime. Obviously, edge rusher is still uh, a, a major need. They have hit on wide receivers with Julio and Calvin, obviously. Uh, and Kyle Pitts, who's an incredible skill player. They hit on uh, AJ uh, last year as well. So, you know, so you've got to hit. Uh, Chris, you follow college football maybe a, a little better than I do. Uh, most everyone probably does during the course of the season. Uh, when you look at mock drafts and stuff like that, and you see some of these top 10 talents uh, that, you know, like uh, there are some guys that can really play, whether it's edge rusher, offensive tackle, or, or even some other um, position that just my, that just may be the, the best player on, on the, on the, on the Falcons board. Yeah. I think, I think something that stands out to me, what Rich McKay actually said in when I talked with him, in before the season started, I don't know, that was September, August, one of those lifetime ago. <laughs> he said one of the mistakes that we've made in the past is that we've tried to get, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said we've tried to we've tried to pick the guy we wanted versus picking the top guy on our board. In this draft, we just grabbed the top guy on our board, even though we kind of that wasn't necessarily a need. So Kyle wasn't necessarily a, a, a gaping hole, but he was the best player on our board. So we're taking the best player on our board. I think the Falcons should continue to take the best player on their board. Yeah. Uh, so however that looks, continue to take the best player on your board and figure out a way to make that player work, if that makes sense. So I think like Tori said, I think they need to hit on all their picks. I think they need to figure out a way to, to make all their picks work, especially with the salary cap situation. You want to make these guys on rookie deals that you can get for like, cheaper than, than other players. You want to make sure they could come in and contribute and you want to make sure that you know all these guys that we did stories on you know a rob and Kassif and yeah. you know, the list goes on make sure you trust them and 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 what and who they've scouted um and and i think there, there's a bunch of talent in the in this draft um you know people have talked about like the kobe dean from georgia the linebacker from georgia or even jordan davis or there's a bunch of ed, edge rushers in this draft as well linemen um there, there's a bunch of players that they could get but i think the importance is just take the best player on your board. Don't overthink it. And things seem to work out like they have with Kyle. Yeah. And they've got that number eight pick. And while we still don't have draft slots for uh, a lot of other selections deeper into the draft, they do have two second round picks. They have their own and they're finally going to get paid back for trading Julio Jones. That, that pick probably won't be super high in the second round, but nonetheless, you can expect or you should expect to get a player of real quality in the second round and that discipline to pick the best player available with, with all these needs that we're talking about. Sure. Look, I, I could say edge rusher at eight period, right? Uh, <laughs> I covered the Raiders and I saw them at number four say, we're going to take a defensive end here, live or die. And then they took Cleland Furl. And that didn't work. <laughs> out well, right. So at some point, I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't yeah. defensive end though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, you, you're well, right. They got, they got Crosby though in that draft, right? Yeah, eventually. You know, fourth <laughs> rounders, are, fourth rounders are people too. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I do think I do think uh, that the Falcons have have a golden opportunity here. And I think just in talking to all these scouts, right? Kyle Smith, very disciplined. 
you know, Terry Fontenot, very disciplined in terms of getting the best player. And if they continue to hit on getting the best player on their board, eventually this team will be deep enough and strong enough to, to compete. Uh, so I think that's important. We're going to talk about this forever, guys, over the course of the weeks and months coming up. But I'm not sure to play some sad violin music right now because this is technically the season finale of Falcon's Final Whistle. All no. seven weeks, we did it. We, for those binge binge listening. <laughs> yeah, just power <laughs> through it all. <laughs> Season one is wrapped. It is wrapped. Uh, I'm, you know, but uh, I think there, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for us to talk down the road over the course of this offseason as we get towards free agency, as we get towards the NFL draft. Heck, as we all just have questions about what comes next. That's a little so teaser. Many. What? So many questions. So I many don't know questions. What the gonna happen. Right. So many questions. Are we gonna address some of those questions? Yeah, we we probably will. Uh, so, gosh, thank you guys so much for sticking through this 17 game campaign for for subscribing, for all the nice reviews, for the comments, for the man given Tori a Dean's favorite mug. Honestly, the uh, yes. real winner, the real winner is the person who sent me the Dean's favorite mug. If anyone wants to send me more Dean's favorite merch, <laughs> I will take it. <laughs> we'll take it. But hey, man, set us up for next season. Give us a five-star rating and a review. Do the same thing for Falcons Audible. Why don't you? Uh, and yeah, man, stay tuned to atlantafalcons.com. Chris, Tori, I said I wasn't going to cry, man. I wasn't going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been fun. Hopefully you guys have uh, enjoyed all this as much as we've enjoyed making it. And uh, stay tuned. Keep that subscribe button on. And there's going to be more good content coming your way real soon. 